Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome back to IT for Sustainability, or ICT for us. Today we'll talk about leverage points. Leverage points are a concept that came from systems engineering. So, um, sorry, not systems engineering, systems thinking. So in systems thinking, we try to abstract from a concrete system and try to think about how that works in terms of what are the things, the elements that compose the system and how do these things change over time. And we can do that pretty much for any system in the world. We can do that for IT systems, for software systems, for companies, for processes that happen in our body, like the way we process nutrition, for example, um, the way how we interact in a social network. It works for anything. It's, it's a really interesting concept. So um, when we use as an example, say, a company, then a company has people working there. That is one of their stocks. So in systems thinking, we often talk about stocks and flows. So the stocks of elements in a system. And flows. How these elements move. Or change. So when we talk about this company, our employees are one stock. The money that they earn is another stock. Um, the products that the company manufactures is a stock. The uh, um, infrastructure assets that a company has, say buildings, vehicles, and so on and so forth, those are stocks. And then there's flows in between. So we can have flows of money to and from employees and to and from the company. We can have vehicles that move to certain locations and away from certain locations. We can have products that get manufactured and shipped out and distributed to customers and then the customers bring back the revenue. And so we see it can become an intricate network of all these stocks and flows. And we will talk about a example of such a stock and flow diagram next time, but because they usually involve a few more elements, I'm not going to draw one up right now because today what I really want to aim at is this concept of leverage points and we'll stick with a very simple example. So when we have this stocks and flow um, representation of a system, then we can think about if I want to affect some change in that system, say in that company, I want to increase the motivation of my employees. What are a couple of ways of doing that? You might say, I can give them more money. And in terms of leverage points, that will be changing a parameter of the system. So in leverage points, we say there are some lower leverage points that are easier to change, but that also won't have that much of a change over time. So yeah, that employee may be happy for a few months if they get more money, but eventually they get used to receiving that increased salary and it'll be back to same, same, back as it was before. Now, what else could I change in a company to make people more motivated? I can maybe change the company culture. So if people just really love showing up at work because they, they like the work culture there, they like interacting with their colleagues and they care about what they do. That's really what's going to keep their motivation at a high level over time. Changing the company culture is also a lot harder than increasing somebody's salary. And therefore that is a higher leverage point. So the lady who came up with the concept of leverage points, uh, her name is Donella Meadows. She and her colleagues worked on 
using systems thinking in consulting for many years until they came across the idea of, hey, maybe we can structure the way how we can change systems in this way so it's easier to replicate by other people. So systems thinking, if we want to affect systems change, makes use, that makes use of leverage points. There are 12 leverage points and we order them reverse because of that impact increase that I was talking about. So that lowest impact, we can have a little effect with that and it's not hard to change, we can easily do it. Those are parameters, like increasing somebody's salary. Then the next one, you know what, I wrote this down the wrong way. <laughs> I was supposed to start from the top. So I'm just going to delete this here and make, um, make it look really gnarly. Yeah, it's not that bad. Okay. That'll do. So the parameters go up here. And then from the parameters, if I change somebody's income, okay. If I want to increase the income of all my employees, what does that mean? I need a bunch more money. So my stock, the stock of the budget that I need to have to be able to hand out to my employees, that was that is the next uh, thing that I can change. So the size of stocks and buffers. It's a little harder to change that because that means my company needs to earn more money, so I have to figure out how that might go. Next thing is the structure of stocks. Maybe I figured out that, oh, if I give my employees some shares in the company, that would increase their motivation. Yes, it's also going to be a lot more work. So that would be changing the structure of a stock and a flow. The length of delays, this is where it gets a little trickier. That means if my employees used to get paid at the end of the month and I want to now pay them mid-month to have it closer or to pay them in a two-week cycle instead of a monthly cycle to give them access to their resources more frequently, that may be harder to implement in the system. And then there is the strength of negative feedback loops. So we haven't talked a whole lot about feedback loops yet, but there are systems when, um, when I give you a little bit of something and then more of that happens over time, that is a positive feedback loop. A negative feedback loop is a self-regulating one. So when I, when I add something more of one kind, then something else is going to happen that regulates that first part that's happening. And we will talk about a more detailed example of feedback loops in one of the upcoming lectures. So the seventh one talks about uh, driving the positive feedback loops. So one example for the regulating feedback loop for the negative feedback loop in number eight would be employee gets money, um, employee spends money. So that is a regulating thing. You will always have a certain amount of budget, hopefully, in your account, so you're not overspending. Um, but that way, the account is regulated by what's coming in and by what goes out of it. Now, a positive feedback loop would be you invest that money somewhere, you invest it really well, and you get more money 
and more money and you put in more money from um, the gains that you made and you have increasing value. So that's a positive feedback loop because that is hopefully just going to grow towards, say, a retirement fund or something like that. Number six, structure of information flow. As we come higher and higher, these get harder to change. So structure of information flow in a system can be something like how management informs their employees of decisions they're making for the company. And um, changing how information propagates through a system and how things communicate, that requires, that requires a lot more change in the organizational structures. And then five, the rules of the system. So maybe according to what people get paid. If you used to have a management bonus and now you want to get rid of them, of that bonus, be prepared for a lot of pushback from your employees. It's not easy to change the rules of the system or try to make them show up every morning at 8 a.m. if that was not a rule before. You're going to get a lot of pushback on that. That's why those become harder. And then, um, changing the system structure gets even harder. So depending on what organizational system you set up your company according to, that probably made sense at the time, but now you try to restructure it and you have all these shifting parts underneath. It's like when you change something up here, some of those other leverage points are bound to change as well. There is an organizational rule that says if you do manufacture a product, then your company is most likely structured according to how that product is structured. An easy way to look at that is automotive companies. So in an automotive company, you will usually have um, a big subunit that takes care of the engine. You will have a big subunit that takes care of entertainment systems. You will have a big unit that takes care of the body of the car and so on and so forth. So the organization is structured in the same way as the product is structured. And that's hard to change. Number three, goals of the system. Now, for most companies, because that's the way how our economy runs, they have to be oriented towards profit, at least to a certain extent. Now, if you used to run a for-profit company that was always just out for maximizing the profit, but now you want to change and you want to um, tailor this towards a non-profit company, that would be major restructuring. Like, you are changing the entire game. You're changing what your company is about. So that one's hard. And then um, we become even more abstract. The mindset out of which your system came. And because I brought the example with switching from for-profit to non-profit, that means you have to change your entire thinking for um, how you want to run in this economy. If you want to implement a new goal, then having a new mindset behind that is going to be what makes that goal really strong. But it's also a very fundamental change. And if you are running a company, make sure that that gets passed on to, well, you won't be able to pass it on to all your employees, honestly, but that you have your executive team on board that can then try to influence and convince the people below them that that is a good direction to go in. And then the most abstract one is number one. Are you ready for this? It's the power to transcend paradigms. I'm going to write this down so you can digest in the meantime. And what that means is, despite our best intentions, 
despite developing an entirely new mindset, despite being willing to change the rules of a system, the structure of a system, and all these other things, despite the fact that we sat together for a very long time and tried to figure out what is going to be the best solution for this challenge that we see in our system, we probably won't be able to have a solution that will last from now on to forever and eternity. So it means that we understand that despite the best intentions, there will be new context shifts in the future, there will be more learning that's going on, there will be more understanding of other influencing factors that will eventually make us understand, oh, you know what, this thing we thought two years ago was the perfect way to run this company and the perfect solution to all of our problems. Guess what, we've learned something new and now we gotta start rethinking again. So eventually the power to transcend paradigms is almost the notion of humbling yourself that you'll always continue to learn, hopefully. Because what, what are you gonna do once you stop learning? Mm doesn't sound like a good idea. We always want to continue to grow as human beings and we always want to continue learning. And that means to accept the fact that eventually the paradigm that we're running our life according to right now may not turn out to be the best one in five years or in 10 years for the situation we're facing then. So I encourage you to take the time and think through those 12. I remember the first time that I came across them the original paper by Donella Meadows, I think I read it five or six times because it's such a lot of content and it's so many things to think about. And some of them do become pretty abstract. But I promise once you sit down with an example and you go through that for a while, it will start to make sense. So I'm gonna put this into the references, the original paper by Donella Meadows, which you can also download from her website, and a paper that I wrote with colleagues for IEEE software that talks about how we can use leverage points in software engineering. Thank you.